Hi, uh, it is noon on Wednesday, and uh, so this must be Writing Wednesday with uh, me, Janet Fitch, uh, where I answer your writing questions, and uh, feel free to comment, at, to ask other questions uh, in the comment section, and I can, uh, uh, I can answer your questions about technique, about uh, storytelling, about the writing life. Um, happy to do so. I am going to be teaching. Uh, let's see how my sound is. Oh, right in the middle. Um, <laughs> hi, Pawan. Uh, it's uh, I'll be teaching a class in point of view coming up pretty soon. Uh, the weekend of the third. May 13th, 14th, and 15th through the Community of Writers. Uh, so that's communityofwriters.org if you're interested. It's going to be an intensive weekend deep dive into techniques of storytelling, which is what, uh, what point of view is, um, where you put the camera, focal length, um, question of uh, authorial voice and, and you know use of narrator use of you know what are the most common points of view and uh, what are some uncommon points of view you know things that you might not have ever thought of trying um things that you think you might dislike but or think are old-fashioned or something but when put to uh different artistic use can be uh uh, kind of revitalized, just like comic books, you know, it was considered a very debased form. and But when taken over by people with an artistic intention, um, it's been remade uh, into the graphic novel, which is uh, one of the uh, stalwarts of our current day. Uh, so we're going to look at all kinds of different ways of of uh, handling point of view. Um, we even have a point, a couple point of view questions uh, for today's Writing Wednesday. So if you're interested in signing up for point of view, it's uh, uh, registration still open, uh, communityofwriters.org. So, hey everybody. Hi Jeffrey, hi Shayla. Good to see y'all. Um, it's spring, it's, I've been in a funk for a while, so uh, it's nice today is a really good day and uh, in a good place. Yay! <laughs> it's hard. Writers, you know, we create out of our own moods and sentiments and stuff, and if you can't reach your, uh, all the flexible kinds of emotion and perception, uh, writing is hard. It's hard anyway, but when you're in a funk, it's really hard. Hi, Ruthie. Um, so we had some, I have some really interesting questions today. And if you have questions, uh, just put them in the, uh, in the comments and I'll uh, answer your questions as well. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your uh, encouragement to come out of the funk. Um, uh, JD asks, who writes the best action scenes? Who writes the best dialogues? Wow. So there's a William Goldman fan. I'm not into ranking. You know, I think that's kind of a, a an obsession uh, in our time. Who's the best of this? Top five this, you know, likes, you know, stars. We, we are kind of in a ranking m moment. And it's done for you know, it's being exacerbated by commercial um, interests, you know, to further involve you, rate the best, rate the best. You know, who writes good action scenes? Um, you know, I, I always like Elroy uh, is, a, you know, a lot of the crime writers are very strong in action scenes. Um, you know, I assume what, that's what you mean by an action scene. I mean, all scenes are action scenes. They're all live action. Uh, and dramatic action is uh, um, is action as well. You know, so who writes a really dramatic action scene? Um, there, are, there are a lot of them, you know, a lot of great writers. Uh, action scenes are usually best done in third person uh, for reasons that we're actually going to address today. Uh, best dialogue, 
Uh, I just taught a class in dialogue, so that's very much on my mind. I would say, you know, best dialogue. Um, Joan Didion, you know, is an excellent uh, writer of dialogue. Um, uh, who else, do, who do I use uh, in that dialogue class? Oh, I mean, having coming out of my fog, my funk, you know, it's, um, you know, dialogue, I like dialogue that people track what the other person is saying, so there's not a lot of meet and greet, there's not a lot of, huh, what do you mean by that? Robert Stone, you know, hands down, my favorite, um, or one of my favorites. See, I'm ranking two. <laughs> Uh, Didion Stone, um, uh, oh, there are so many wonderful writers of dialogue. T.C. Boyle is, is fabulous. Um, uh, uh, so many, so many good ones. As more come to me, uh, I'll, I'll pick this thread up again. Um, uh. Uh, Jeffrey asks, that thinks my young adult would make a wonderful graphic novel. Uh, what are my thoughts about that? Uh, it's a young adult uh, coming of age. Uh, it probably would make a wonderful graphic novel. Um, I've never attempted the graphic novel. Uh, usually there's a writer and an illustrator. But I think the writer has to have also that sort of storyboardy frame of mind. Um, the idea of going back and working with, you know, a graphic novel or a play or a screenplay or something of a work that I've already spent years on isn't really a tantalizing um, notion. <laughs> but if anybody else wanted to do it, I, I would embrace that. Hi, Lewis. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. So here's a, here's a, a, um, uh, First question I have here uh, from the interwebs, and this was, is it possible to be good at writing memoir, but not so much on writing fiction? Um, years ago, I probably would have said no, that, you know, it, it comes from the same place, your ability to frame a story, your ability to bring a reader in. Memoir would be like a first person novel. Um, but I have seen, now I've watched memoirists try to write novels and discovered that indeed it's not the same, that some people work well with a story they already know and can write a very um, just mesmerizing uh, memoir. But when faced with the invention that fiction requires, um, they, they seem to um, run aground a bit, which is not to say don't write a novel. I, I, I always think you can do so much more with a novel. Uh, it, uh, it always kind of unnerves me when novelists decide to write memoirs because it's like they burn their material when they write the memoir. Once we know where it all comes from, it's never as good as the fiction because they can, in fiction, you can amplify things, you can make it more exciting, you can make it have things happen that didn't happen. Um, you know, you use that material as your, your palette, uh, your colors, your, you know, pastels or whatever, paints, but you can use them in a, in such a heightened, compressed, um, you can change things around. You can make three different people one person. You can change the timeline. You can change what happens. You know, when I was a kid, I would tell stories about my, what happened. Hi, Jill. You can tell stories about what happened and for me, what might have happened was so much more interesting than what actually happened. I, I was considered a tremendous liar when I was a kid because I didn't, couldn't tell the difference between what happened and what could have happened. 
you know, just overactive imagination. Um, so I say, you know, I, I always like, I prefer the fiction, although there are fabulous memoirs being written, especially now, this is like a golden age for, of the memoir. Um, but not, no, it's, it is totally possible to be good at writing memoir and not be able to, um, break out of what happened, a story that already exists and, uh, invent and just be lost in the, you know, having to invent. So I think that is, um, very possible. And then here is another one. Um, are there, from David, um, are there any novels that are practically impossible to make into movies? I think when you ask yourself that question, you are pinpointing what fiction can do, what fiction is, and the difference of it from the medium, uh, the visual medium of film. Um, I know that, Fran uh, that, uh, um, Jonathan Franzen, who, you know, is a controversial figure for many reasons. Um, but he is such a champion of fiction, of fiction on the page, of books, um, of novels. And he says, I try to write novels that cannot be made into movies. He tries. I think the more um, complex the story is, the bigger the book, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to make it, to boil it into a 90 minute film. Um, the more introspective it is, the more difficult it is to um, make into a film. So the more time the character spends in the internal world, you just can't do that in film um, without Either you use a clunky voiceover or you can, you know, you can use, I mean, an artistic poetic camera can give you a mood, but uh, internal stories are hard. And then when you get into stories like, I just read this brilliant book. Oh, where is it? I read this brilliant book. I cannot recommend it enough. It's uh, Lisa Robertson's The Baudelaire Fractal. It's the best book I've read this, uh, this year so far. And it is completely internal. It's first person. It is, uh, the character giving their impressions and thoughts about the world. And I think you could probably cobble together a story from it, but it's not about story. I mean, I'll talk about this in the point of view class. So if people can't take the class, maybe they can get a little bit of a flavor of some of the things I'm going to do. But first person, which this is definitely a first person book, um, is all about consciousness. And consciousness is a subject that can be written about, but you, it is almost impossible to portray on the screen. Um, so the more it works that modernist project of creating the interior life of characters, the more difficult uh, that is to make a film. So um, uh, Baudelaire Fractal is just, um, it's the writer telling you, I, you know, uh, and having their their opinions about the world is what you read it for. Um, and that is not something that really comes across. You have to have a lot of talkiness uh, in a film to get it to work that way. And certain films like, you know, After Sunset or Before Sunrise or whatever are pretty... Uh, a presentation of consciousness, but not everybody's going to sit through a talky film like that. Um, let's see if I can give you an example of her style. 
Reading unfolds like a game called I in public gardens, in good weather, in a series of worn down hotel rooms, in museum in winter, where I is the composite figure who is going to write but hasn't yet. I mean, you cannot portray that in uh, a visual medium. It's why fiction rocks. <laughs> Here's a question from Lisa. How do you, Janet, decide what domain of time you will write about in a novel? For example, a period of one year versus decades. Oh, man. Okay. Um, I usually start with a situation that puts pressure on a character. And by the nature of the situation, I will have a pretty darn good feeling for how long the expanse of time is going to be. If I say, you know, I have this young, um, uh, passionate, impressionistic young poet who I'm going to put through the Russian Revolution. I'm going to follow her through the Russian Revolution. I'm pretty sure that I'm looking at six years. I'm looking at 19... I like to start before the action begins. So start in 1916, so we get a sense of the world as it was before it was broken open by the revolution, and then I take her through. So I knew that was going to be six years. I'm writing now, I'm writing a novel, um, a family novel um, that is, you know, it's one of those things when you have to put somebody into care you have to put somebody into a home uh, in your family. Um, and that is usually a process that takes about, you think it's going to take less time than it does. So uh, it's going to take anywhere from three months to a year. So you won't know kind of exactly how long it's going to be until you get there. But I have a pretty good uh, idea that we're looking at about intensive three months and maybe um, checking in periodically up to a year. Um, I think that many people like to try to keep it to as short a time period as possible, you know, three weeks, a week, a day. I mean, Nicholson Baker, you know, the bullet to the brain. I mean, the whole thing was in the time somebody, a bullet comes into somebody's head and the time that they expire from the experience. So he likes that kind of thing. There's a, he has a whole book, I think it's called The Mezzanine, where it's all the characters' thoughts as they're going up an escalator. So very short compression, but there is no time in the interior world. There is no time on the psychological level. So even if you, you know, you limit your uh, exterior story to the length of time of an escalator ride, it could be a lifetime in their head. So um, you don't necessarily... You can decide the exterior time, but because fiction is all about the interior world, um, or it can be, then that opens up, and it could open up and up and up. I mean, Joyce, Ulysses, that's one day. Uh, that's a pretty big one. So domain of time, you can guess by the kind of what you're what the problem of the novel is. You can guess how approximately how long in the exterior world, but you don't know what you're going to be bringing in from other parts of that person's life. Um, okay, let's see what else we have. Here's one. Um, what is the distinction between being a good storyteller and a good writer? Well, that's a really interesting question. Oh, I'm just reminded about, you know, more about that interior world, exterior world of, and the, you know, the books that nobody thought could be made into a movie. And then they've been made into wonderful movies like The English Patient. You know, that is, you know, that moves around in time 
in the interior. Um, and it's so poetic, you know, who would have thought that they could make a movie out of it? Uh, people often, Hannah says, people often say show, don't tell. How do you escape becoming, coming across as too tell focused in a consciousness based world? People say things, they have these little mottos that they hang on to, like, you know, like Dumbo's white feather. You know, these suggest, these are just suggestions, you know, and in fiction, every for every suggestion of do this don't do that there will be an example exactly contradicting it of some great work of literature so it's a rule of thumb rather than you know the ten commandments it's it's an idea it just is saying show when you you know that showing is more engaging but something that's completely shown gets very face in carpet. You get really, and I'll talk about this in point of view, especially in first person. You get really sick of having, as a reader, of having your nose in the carpet at all times, which doesn't mean that there aren't brilliant works of literature that you are in the carpet and looking at the weave of the carpet and the stuff in the carpet through the whole book. You know, it's just awareness that you need to be aware that people get restless when there are no scenes and you better be a snake charmer if you are going to not have real-time scenes and this this book the Baudelaire fractal I don't think there's any real-time scenes in this maybe brief ones maybe like a sentence or two or three you know this is all consciousness but it's so brilliant so tell away you know so these are rules, these are just always rules of thumb, you know, with fiction, you know, you could always think of counterexamples, but it's a way not to get lost. It's a way of giving you a rope over the bridge that you can hang on to in the flood of possibilities. Um, so show, you know, showing is more engaging. But usually what happens is the telling, the narrative, compresses time, gets us through something, and we get to understand the setup. And then the real-time scenes, which is the show part, the real-time scenes kind of slow time down and expand into real-time people talking, people seeing, people responding you know, the sensual world, it expands in the moment of conflict. And then we see what happens. And then you can go back into the narrative and tell uh, to get us into the next scene. Otherwise, you're constantly in the carpet. Uh, sometimes you need that focal length to come out and see a bigger picture and get a bigger thought and then go back in. So I'd say more of a rhythm. Um, so if you're too, uh, it's all taste, you know, if, if it's too tell focused, if people are like, you need to have a scene in here somewhere, if you feel the need for a real time scene, you know, then that impulse to show not tell comes out. But if you have a simply brilliant person who wants to tell you about the world and then use exemplars of their life to show what they mean, you know, then you get a book like this. This is not going to be on everyone's list. You know, most people, you're in the hospital, you're sick, and you just want to read a thriller. Um, then you're going to show, 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 show. Um, but there's a there's a place for everything. There's a place for everything. And the storytelling techniques match the story that's being told. Uh, thank you, Jill. Got a compliment there on my... Uh, um. So here's a question. What is the distinction between being a good storyteller and a good writer? Isn't that interesting? Well, writing is done for the page and storytelling is done for the ear. So uh, come gather around me, children, a story I will tell. 
the pretty boy Floyd in Outlaw, Oklahoma knew him well. You know, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to tell a story, story, uh, oral storytelling, um, you know, going back to Homer, going back to Scheherazade, going back in culture. Uh, these are stories that they have a lot of repetitions because they're oral and they need to be remembered. Usually there's a refrain. Stor fairy tales, when they're told, they have... Um, usually classic openings once upon a time there was a blah 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 who had three sons blah, blah, blah. um and um so they have their their form and uh it's not about written expression it's about the story so it's not going to be so much about character development usually storytelling uh it's more about the roles that these characters play. Yeah. Once you start getting into writing, um, you have you get a different kind of. It's a different kind of demand, because it's about sentences. You write a sentence and then another sentence, and it stays there. You know, it doesn't flow by the way a story does. So there's much more attention on the actual sentence and how you put a sentence together. There's a craft to writing that's not just about story. It's about, it has a story and you need to be a good storyteller and know when to pace and how to, how to retard uh, the sharing of information in a way that doesn't piss the reader off. So that's the same as your audience, you know, you kind of hold, but first you need to know about cousin Johnny's second marriage and it's like ah, I wanted to know but it, it keep, keeps us on the hook so storytelling is all about keeping people on the hook and that is part of being a good writer but it's not the whole deal because you also have to put sentences on the page and the sentences have to be good and the sentences have to pace you you know uh and there's a so there's a lot more to the art of writing than just storytelling. I'd say that's, that's the big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, also, I mean, sto storytelling is an interaction between an audience and um, the, the storyteller moment by moment. So it's, um, so there's an exchange, you know, like I can see what, if I'm telling a story, I can see whether, you know, the five-year-olds are getting up and moving around or if they're listening, you know, and I can change my story seeing how the audience is reacting. And that's, you know, when you write, when you write, you are the first audience, um, and you're usually picturing someone, but it not necessarily, a, a, you know, an auditorium. You're thinking of usually one person who, you know, your ideal reader, maybe it's yourself, you know, of how you think a story should be told, what's going to engage you. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, here's another question. Um, how do you describe sitting positions in writing? Well, that's a technique question. That's a good, that's a good um, question. Uh, there's something called Frankenstein writing. You know, the first, what happens is in, in the beginning, when you're a new writer, say, you, you know, you're just learning, um, is that you don't put any detail at all. You just think, oh, all I have to do is tell the story. So you tell the story, and it's a three-page story. I mean, this was me when I started writing. I would write a three-page story and just, like, not know. I've told the story. I don't know what else to say about it, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have any sense that I needed to detail a world for, for the reader, that I needed to ask questions about what I was writing. I needed to, you know, it was a hot day. How hot was it? You know, how did you know it was hot? Where were you? You know, textures and, you know, all the senses and stuff. I, so many things. And then um, 
describing people uh, was very, very difficult. Um, it's why in art class, people do a lot of, of studies, um, sketch of the, you know, from the model. Um, so describing sitting positions, you don't want to be too anatomical. And she had her, you know, leg crossed two inches from the knee. Uh, and she was, the body was twisted this way. And the, you know, it's like your, your reader's like, come on. Okay. I've seen a person sitting, you know, I don't need that kind of a detail. We call that Frankenstein writing. So what happens is you go from uh, no detail to over detail, you know, instead of having somebody, she came into the room, uh, she flicked the switch over the couch and uh, uh, there in the flash of light was John's dead body. Then you get to, you get to detail. And I reached for the switch and uh, taking it between my forefinger and my thumb, I, I pressed it vertically uh, at, in, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 you turn on the light. <laughs> so there's detail, too much detail. So how do you describe sitting positions? First, you have to notice sitting positions. And the way you notice is think of center, center of gravity first. Are they leaning back, resting in the back of the chair? Or are they leaning forward? Where's the weight? Where's the weight? Are they off at one side? the other, you know, leaning on something or sitting up very straight. What's their posture? So first you, you have to identify it for yourself. Then you have to figure out what's important, what will leave a lasting impression, and then what is too much information about somebody's sitting. So say you're having a dialogue scene and you have somebody, you want to say somebody sitting in a chair in a certain way. Notice that we don't notice our own position unless we're super uncomfortable. We don't notice our own position. We notice other people's position. So in first person, you're going to be looking, or close third, you're going to be looking at the other person. Uh, and their position. So Debbie sat in, opposite me in, you know, in a straight chair, her legs twined together like, um, you know, like a wisteria vine. The foot that's tucked behind the other foot, you know how some people sit. So first you have to look, and often you can this is a great thing to do if you work in an office and you have to have meetings. You know, use that time to describe how people are sitting <laughs> and put them in your notebook, in your writer's notebook, uh, the, the ring binders that I'm begging you guys to do. Um, you know, somebody who sits with their legs all twined together like that are people usually who are very limber and nervous, teenagers, you know classically sit like that. A nervous, limber, slender person sits like that. Um, you know, a, you, so you, you put a little of their character in to the sitting position. You know, the guy on the subway sitting opposite you, taking up, you know, two seats because he's spread out like a, like margarine on a piece of toast. Um, it's, there he is and he's kind of, that's kind of sleazy and he's taking up more room than he, uh, should. So you get a, f a, a spin on him and you get a, how he's sitting. Uh, somebody who is relaxed, sitting back in a chair, you know, um, Jim, you know, I gave Jim the bad news. He, um, he turned halfway away from me and crossed his legs uh, into the aisle. So now we see how Jim is, but it's in reaction to something I've said. 
it's not overly detailed um how somebody sits, how somebody stands, where the weight is, shouldn't be a technical description, although the observation can be technical. You as a writer, you know, if you watch a movie and stop it when different people are sitting different ways and then do it like a fast sketch like an artist would and just try to capture how they are physically. Um, and then if there's any emotional... Um, if there's any emotional overlay, you can note that. So how does somebody who's miserable sit? How does somebody who's ex excited sit? Watching for cliches, you know, sitting on the edge of your chair is just, you cannot use it. No. Anything you've ever heard before is a cliche and is banned. And we all have read that one. Um, somebody who is nervous sits how? Somebody who's defeated sits how? How do their hands hang between their knees and they lean forward, putting their weight, exhausted weight on their knees? Um, so all of this should go into your notebook and have a, do a page of how people sit. Do two pages of how people sit. You know, watch movies and freeze them and describe how that person's sitting. Um, and then there was a related question. I couldn't believe this. Related question, point of view question, um, is how do you describe fighting in writing? How do you describe fighting in writing? Um, and especially how do you do it in, a, in first person? A fight. Well, in third person, you're, you move back and in close third you're you are one of those people but you also can step back and see them fighting um you're looking for um words that have a certain amount of violence in them um uh, don't look at the three syllable words here we're looking at speed and power uh in the language uh and, you know, notice words like, you know, words like topple, you know, as somebody's falling over. I mean, look at your active vocabulary for um, the transfer of weight. Um, you know, how, how, you know, look, I don't mean necessarily go to the thesaurus, although if you can't think of anything, just start looking at the thesaurus and looking at different words for fall, you know, fall backwards, fall forwards. Uh, think of sound, think of, you know, think of sound, think of what's going on around people. Have you ever seen a fight where two people are fighting on the street and people are walking around them or people stop to watch, you know, that's pulling the focal length back. We'll talk about that in the POV class, you know, where you get the people around as well as, you know, the people fighting, people like putting some money on some one of the fighters. Uh, or are you in there getting your face smashed? In? Uh, in first person, you're feeling everything. Also in close third, you're feeling it. So what does it feel like to get hit in the face? If you've never been hit in the face, it might help to watch maybe a boxing movie or, uh, you know, any kind of violent, <laughs> except so, so much of our violent quote unquote entertainment uh, is so depersonalized that people get hit and it's like nothing. It is not nothing, you know. Just remember if somebody accidentally elbowed you in the face, you know, where they hit your nose and, you know, I mean, even an accidental hit is painful. So how do you describe a painful uh, occurrence? You know, her, her, you know, she elbowed me in the eye. Um, I could feel it all the way, you know, all the way to my, into my chest. You know, uh, you know, I was going to have to skip work tomorrow. This was going to be a really bad one. Also fight in a fight scene, like any action scene, um, 
it's got to move. There's not a lot of time for introspection introspection it's not the time to talk about hegel you know <laughs> it's like you know i ducked and i i felt her fist you know grazing the side of my head oh my god uh you know i i tumbled you know i tumbled and hit, you know my head smacked the curb and i don't remember anything after that so you were looking for words like smack and tumble and you know very active verbs all right. There's nothing like a good fight scene. Um, try it. Try it. Uh, here's uh, Lisa thinking some more about time. How do you decide whether to write in present versus past tense? Oh, we are going to talk about this in the point of view class. I hope you're taking it, Lisa. Um, the um, present is something that is occurring as we read it is is a live scene it's something that's happening right now whereas the past tense is is remembered so the past tense gives you gives the reader the assurance that this is real this really happened and it's perp being purposely told there's a reason we are hearing this whereas present tense the reader is left in some doubt as to, is there a reason for this? Um, it's happened. We're just getting it as it happens. You know, is this being chosen for some reason or is it just what's happening? It's like children always tell a story in the first person and you're like, come on already. And then we go, you know, it's like, um, so how do you decide whether to write in the present or in the past? Um, if you write a, if you use a narrator or authorial voice, you're usually going to be in the past and they're going to be telling a story that, orchestrating the telling of a story that has already happened. And so you're going to be able to get perspective on that story and you're going to get interjections uh, from that narrative voice um, on a story that has already happened. There's no focal length to present tense. You're just face and carpet. Um, and uh, it's the fun part is that you're it's the immediacy of first pres of present tense. You're it's exciting, but it's hard to get back from it. Uh, past tense is a more complete experience, right? Because this act, this happened already, and it's given us a chance to think about what was the important part. Um, I uh, definitely um, there's some such wonderful things written in the present tense, but in general, and um, publishers see first person present tense as a mark of the amateur. They are much, they are not as excited about opening a manuscript and seeing first person present tense. It is a very childlike way to, to see the world. Um, I'm in pro, it's me and only, I can only see what I can see. I don't have out, outside information and it's happening right now. It's rushing into me. It is like so face and carpet. Uh, and that can be very exciting, but um, an experienced reader sees a lot of it, and most of it is not as thoughtful as things written in the past tense. So that's just a, just an FYI. Uh, if you're going to do present tense, make it worth our while. You know, make sure the language is good, make sure it's really vivid, that the, you know, the limitation is um, of being face and carpet uh, is worth the trouble. Um, Jeffrey says, what's your opinion on those choose your own adventure books where the reader is the main character? Uh, it's usually, a, you know, a book for children. You know, uh, an adult looks to the writer to make these decisions and make the best decision, the most interesting decision. And um, um, 
take responsibility for the story. Um, I think that the choose your own adventure is fun for kids because it's like being a co-writer. It's you're creating the story along with the writer and uh, you can try different things. You can be the rabbit or you can, you know, the rabbit can take over the world in one version and the rabbit can, uh, can, uh, you know, run for Congress. Uh, you know, I don't know what the rabbit does. Choose your own adventure. I liked them when I was little. Um, I don't like them anymore. I, not for adults, you know, writers should try harder and make a decision. Like how does the world you see happening? Um, what do you really believe happens? Uh, it's a, it's kind of a moral out that I, I don't care, really care for that much. Although I do like stories of, you know, of multiple universes and the different ways that story could be told or what could happen to that story in different I mean, Specimen Days by Michael Cunningham has three similar stories told in three different genres and time periods. So there's a romance, there's a Western, and there's science fiction. And there's always three characters. They have a similar relationship to each other, uh, all, all very different. Um, different outcomes, different everything. Um, but in a way, it is for the writer a choose-your-own-adventure story. Um, and uh, I, I loved I loved it, especially the... Oddly enough, because Michael Cunningham is a... He's sort of a Virginia Woolfian literary writer, I was really surprised that I liked the science fiction one the best. So that's Specimen Days by Michael Cunningham. Um, I've got another question here. Um, oh, here's one. This is interesting. Now, um, I think that some of you know that my, um, my husband is a comedy writer and has a book out. Oh, I don't see it. Not to hand. Uh, has a book out called Comedy Writer. His name is Andrew Nichols. Oh, there it is. I see it. Um across the room, of course. Um, he has a book called Comedy Writer, and it's probably, it's one of the best writing books I've ever seen, uh, although it's specifically supposed to be about comedy. There's a lot of stuff for all of us. And this is an interesting question that I got. Um, to, make, to what extent does comedic writing require sad writing to make it work? I, I could call him in, but uh, I think he's working. <laughs> um, I don't think that it requ that comedic writing requires sad writing at all. I actually think that sad writing, and I don't know quite what what you thought think of as sad writing, but I, I would say you know having a sad situation dealt with realistically, and then comedic. Um, I don't think that works at all. I think that when you are making fun of something, say you're writing a parody of, I don't know what's a sad, you know, you know you're writing a parody of Romeo and Juliet. I think to insert real grief into that story will kill your comedy. I think they're too uh, mutually... Mm, they they're they douse they they this the introduction of the serious material douses the fun of the comedic writing now i believe in including co comedy in anything you write you know that there should be wit there should be humor because even in a very serious book you know like the Revolution of Marina M or Times of Lost Cathedral or Painted Black or any, actually anything I've written. Uh, pretty serious mostly, but there's always humor. The character can have funny takes on things. Even, I mean, anybody's had, you know, if you, when you and your cousins kind of 
fall apart at a funeral and everything, you start laughing at everything and you just can't stop. You know, that happens a lot in life. You know, it's just too, uh, there's, the emotion is too, is so high that in grief that sometimes absurdity helps you take a breath. It helps you breathe. It helps you get through it, you know, and I know it's inappropriate that you and your cousins are laughing during the service. Um, but everybody understands that just the, the how high key the moment is, um, that there's a need to laugh. There's a need to breathe. And after, like, you know, if you have a very serious scene, it's sometimes nice to pull back, have some other notes or even in a very serious scene somebody can be witty somebody can have a funny thought about someone and it helps the reader breathe you cannot hold their head under water for 300 pages you know they need to breathe and humor works that way but i think comedic writing does not require sad writing to make it work no i mean if you're writing a comedy you do not want to be inserting realistic grief, realistic, you know, trauma into that. It just will kill the bubbles. You know, I, I knew somebody who worked in the post office when I was in uh, college and they did a lot of, there was a lot of alcohol consumption behind the scenes in those days. I, I'm sure, oh, I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore. But there was at that time and, and somebody would put their, uh, talk about putting the the um, Jack Daniels or whatever into the can of Seven Up, and he's, it just kill the bubbles. You know, you don't want to kill the bubbles. Um, well, all right, and then we had another question here. Um, let's see if I can find it. Oh, Lisa, good. If open-ended stories appeal to you, you might enjoy writing for gaming. Oh, that's really interesting. Because that choose-your-own-adventure, I mean, that is definitely the stuff of video games. That's why people love them, I think. Um, but on the page, I, I just don't think they really pull through. So anyway, uh, barring um, any other questions, uh, I'll say that, uh, again point of view, uh, May 13th, 14th, and 15th, so it's a Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, uh, the 13th of May to the 15th of May, and uh, enrollment's still open, so it's um, communityofwriters.org, um, and uh, I wish you good writing. Thank you for joining me. Okay, bye.